Arvind, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, I'm Arvind Ramnathan from uh, INSTEM, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the National Science Day talks. Uh, so as uh, most of you know, the National Science Day is celebrated uh, usually on the 28th of February uh, as a mar to mark the discovery of the Raman effect by the great Indian physicist, Dr. Uh, Sir uh, C.B. Raman. And uh, as most of you also know that he won the Nobel Prize uh, in physics in 1930. So I'm uh, welcoming numerous members of our scientific community here, but I'm especially pleased to welcome uh, numerous college students and their faculty to this uh, these series of talks that you'll hear today. So uh, I'm uh, very pleased that more than 400 students, uh, at least uh, 400 students or so, I think are joining us today on uh, Zoom and on the live stream. And these, uh, these students and these faculty are from numerous colleges, at least four of them or so are uh, from uh, Karnataka, Bangalore, Ujre, Mangalore. And we have uh, also two colleges from Chennai and Kerala as of uh, last count. So welcome all of you. And I'm uh, really excited that you could be here with us. And uh, I expect this to be one of a series of numerous, numerous interactions in STEM will have with all of you in the coming time. And uh, please uh, stay tuned for other such series that will be coming your way. So uh, the theme of the National Science Day, as you uh, all know from the poster, is it's uh, the future of science, technology, and innovation, impact on education, skills, and work. And this is extremely apt given the uh, situation we have been in and as our economy emerges from this impact of COVID. And I know numerous uh, of you are um, preparing to uh, take the next steps in your careers or you're trying to strategize your careers. So uh, I think you'll learn a lot from uh, the imminent panels that we have today uh, from their talks. Uh, and as uh, Chandrakant just noted uh, on the final note, please uh, do mention your college and your institution as you ask questions. And uh, so let's uh, not delay any further. And I hand this off uh, to our uh, uh, able moderators, Raji and Subalakshmi, who are uh, postdoctoral fellows in our scientific community, and they will be moderating the talks. So please, Raji, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome you all for this exciting session of talks where we are going to have um, uh, scientists from uh, scientists and innovators uh, from uh, life sciences. So in today's session, we are going to hear uh, three speakers, Dr. Vatsala Thirumalai, Dr. Praveen Vamula, and um, Dr. Nareen Chumule. So uh, it's going to be a great opportunity for students to interact with the scientists and to get uh, insights on the future of science innovations and so on. So be ready with your questions and uh, type in your questions in the Q&A box. Um, so in the first session, we'll, we're going to have uh, talks from three of the three of our speakers, and um, then uh, the, then comes the Q and Q and A session where you can direct your questions to our uh, any of our speakers. Um, so with that note, let me introduce the first speaker of uh, today's session, Dr. Vatsala Thirumalai. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Vatsala Thirumalai. Vatsala is an um, associate professor at National Center for Biological Sciences, Bangalore. Her lab works on understanding neural circuits in um, muscular movement. And uh, she is a winner of prestigious uh, Shanti, Swarup, uh, Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award for the year 2020 for her contributions in biological sciences. She is editorial member of several neurobiology journals. She is also involved in several outreach activities to take science to the general public. So I always admire the way uh, she communicate her science to the general public. So with that introduction, um, uh, welcome, I again welcome uh, Dr. Vatsala. Uh, and over to you, Vatsala. Thank you, Raji. Thank you for that very nice introduction. Thank you uh, to all the organizers, Arvind, and uh, also to Chandrakant for very nicely putting this uh, uh, session together. Um, so it's my great, great pleasure today to talk to you. And uh, without further ado, I will start sharing my screen. And uh, okay. So today we are celebrating National Science Day. Every year it's celebrated on the 28th of uh, February. Um, if 
there's a little test I want to do just to check if you were paying attention to Arvind's uh, introduction. Uh, let's see. So National Science Day is celebrated on February 28th to mark which of these events in Professor C.V. Raman's life? Is it his birthday? Is it the award of Nobel Prize? Is it the date on which he got the Nobel Prize? Or is it the date on which he discovered what was later named as Raman effect? Which of these three events is it? A, B or C, A, his birthday, B, award of Nobel Prize, or C, discovery of Raman effect? You can just type it in the chat box or in the comment section of YouTube. Um, so let's see how many of you get the answer correctly. Um, For people the answer, that are on Zoom, you can uh, type the answer in the Q&A button as well. Thank you. Sorry, Vatsula. Yeah. Um, so the correct answer is, of course, discovery of Raman effect. It was on the 28th of February, 1928 that uh, Professor C. V. Raman, along with his student, uh, K. S. Krishnan, conducted experiments that showed that media, anything uh, from gases to liquid to solids, can scatter light and change the property of the wavelengths of the lights coming out of it. Right? And these experiments were con conducted in the Indian Association for Cul uh, Cultivation of Science in Kolkata. And Kolkata in those times was a real hotspot of uh, scientific discovery with many eminent scientists working out of Kolkata, in, including you know, Raman and then uh, Saha, Meghna Saha, Bose, etc. Um, but even though the discovery was made in 1928, the seeds of that discovery came to Raman several years ago. In fact, exactly about 100 years ago in 1921. And there's a little story that goes uh, uh, for this. So you can see how scientific discoveries are generated. So as it happened, Raman was invited for a conference in London and uh, he took a uh, passenger ship go to go to London to attend this um, conference in London. And then he was on his way back. And on his way back, he was looking at the bright blue of the sea and how it changed color from one place to another. And in many cases, you know, the blue of the sky was so different from the blue, brilliant blue of the sea. Until that time, people believed that the blue of the sea was because of reflection from the sky. This was um, rarely scattering effect. But Raman was not satisfied with that answer. He asked, if I take a glass of water, it does not have any color of its own, but the same water in the deep sea appears a brilliant blue. Why is this so? And he went on to conduct some simple experiments even when he was at sea, because he was carrying a small uh, Nicole prism and a spectrograph. And using these instruments, he made several observations, which he then communicated to nature, arguing that the See, the blue of the sea comes from scattering of light by the water itself and not because it was reflecting the color of the sky. So you can see that a major discovery which earned him the Nobel Prize came about because of a simple act of curiosity, because he was curious why the sea appeared blue. But now, a uh, hundred years after this uh, discovery was made, we have the Raman effect being applied to multiple problems across the spectrum of different branches of science, ranging from pharmaceuticals and forensics, geology, mineralogy, medical diagnostics, and life sciences research. Anywhere where you have to analyze a chemical sample and understand what is the chemical nature of this sample, Raman spectra are useful. And as you can see in this little uh, graph on the right hand side, you can even look at the Raman uh, shifts in tumors and understand what whether it's a normal tissue or whether it's a tumor, and even within the tumor, whether it's low grade or high grade. So this method is now being investigated in various kinds of cancer, uh, ranging from bladder cancer, skin cancer, lung cancer, and so on and so forth. The reason why I'm relating this story to you is 
to underline the fact that in science, you need to have curiosity to ask fundamental questions and then the applications become apparent later on. Um, they may not be apparent when you make the discovery, but other investigators can build upon the discovery based on curiosity that was originally made based on curiosity and then the applications will definitely come through. Another more recent example of um, curiosity driven research yielding a very, very useful range of applications is the work of Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, winner, winners of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry this um, last year, 2020, for their discovery of the CRISPR-Cas9 system for genome editing. Now, as it happened, Jennifer and Emmanuel did not uh, set out to find a genome editing tool. That was not their goal. They were simply interested in understanding how certain bacteria have immunity to phages, to viruses that invade them, right? And they were studying the mechanisms by which the bacteria have immunity to these phages. And one such immune mechanism is the CRISPR-Cas9 system that they later then engineered it such that this can be used across the living um, uh, kingdom, across animals and plants to generate different kinds of mutations in the genome. Now, once such a tool has been made based on fundamental discoveries in microbiology, then you can use this tool to generate mutations in plants, in animals, in mosquitoes, you name it, whatever the animal that you're studying, you can make mutations in that. And that is a tremendous opportunity, not only for um, fundamental research, but also for various kinds of applications, ranging from you know, uh, studying disease mechanisms to making biofuels even for the generation of energy. So in this pandemic year, nothing underlines the importance of fundamental research better than COVID-19, right? So we're all familiar with this little picture on the left-hand side, because we've seen this picture of the coronavirus and the public is now aware of fundamental advances in molecular biology. You know, everybody talks about RT-PCR, right? So it's, it's, it's phenomenal that this pandemic has created an opportunity for appreciating how discoveries in basic biology, any field of science, in fact, fundamental research can help address the outstanding problems. Now, all the research that was done in molecular biology over the 40, 50 years, uh, last 40, 50 years, in terms of understanding transcription, translation, what is an mRNA, the universality of the genetic code, uh, reverse transcriptases, all of those things now become useful in understanding how coronaviruses act and in designing diagnostics, in coming up with drug candidates and in the production of vaccines, different kinds of vaccines. You know, now we have the mRNA vaccines, which are very, very efficacious, right? And these advances were possible only because we build upon many, many years of hard work from several groups of scientists working on fundamental questions because they were curious about something, just like Jennifer Dudna and Emmanuel Charpentier were curious about, you know, how bacteria resist phages. There were other people who were curious about various other facets of the living world around us. And that's what enabled these discoveries. And using those discoveries, now we have made use of uh, uh, these knowledge bits to come up with applications. So what I wanted to say with all of that is that science is a collective end endeavor. Though, although there are individuals who make uh, you know, new findings at, at a much uh, higher level at, at leaps and bounds, it comes because many people come together, just like in this picture, you know, many people trying to solve a puzzle together. It's scientists coming from different fields, working together because they are curious, because they are creative, they come up with novel solutions and because they persevere at it. They don't, you know, give up so easily. Even if things fail, they continue to work on it. And that's how 
it has to be. And I hope that today after this lecture, many of you will join up in these efforts and help us discover many, many more fundamental principles uh, in life around us. So having said this, I will now tell you a brief story about discoveries in my own lab. So my lab is interested in how animals move. Um, and we study several aspects of animal movement. For today's talk, I will talk about how animals control the speed of their movement. And this work was principally driven by my student Urvashi Jha and um, the experiments um, that I'm going to describe are done by her. So when you look around you, animals will move at different speeds depending upon their need, right? Even humans ourselves, sometimes we're walking slow, sometimes we're running. Um, what decides how fast an organism moves? So we used zebrafish as our model organism to understand this question. Zebrafish are these little tropical fish that are actually endemic to India. You can find them in different places around India in shallow, uh, slowly moving water streams. And um, the reason for using these fish for our experiment is that number one, they are transparent. So for many experiments, we can actually peer into the nervous system through the skin. They have a very short lifespan by about seven days after fertilization, right? The animal is independent and it moves about looking for food. And so because it's independent, it shows a number of different interesting behaviors. And as I was alluding to um, molecular biology in the previous section, the tools of molecular biology can be used to genetically engineer these zebrafish so that the neurons glow uh, either with green fluorescent protein or derivatives of green fluorescent protein that allow activity, electrical activity of the uh, nervous system to be sampled. But for today's talk, I'm not going to go in, in that direction. We do that in the lab, but uh, that's for a different day. So we use these zebrafish to ask how the fish control the speed with which they swim. And zebrafish, of course, can swim at very, very different speeds. On the right hand side here is the escape response. So these larvae, they call larvae, see when they are touched, they swim away from the noxious stimulus. That's how they escape from predators. And you see, as you can see the timestamp above here, it's in the millisecond range. So it's a very fast behavior. And the reason you're seeing it so slow is because we have captured it at very high frame rates. But they also can exhibit slow movements such as spontaneous swimming where they are exploring their neighborhood like this larva does over here. It's randomly swimming in all directions and it's sampling its environment. Sorry, I think I got disconnected. Um, you will have to share your screen again, Vatsala. Uh, do excuse us for a few seconds. Uh, Vatsala is having some uh, connectivity uh, issues from her side. Can you hear me? Uh, Vatsala, we can hear you, but uh, 
your call is freezing from time to time. Maybe you can shut off your video. That might help in the low bandwidth. Yeah, I will stop my video. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and you can share your screen again if you want. Yeah, yeah, I will do that. Okay, hopefully you can uh, see my screen now. Yes. Yeah. So, so when you present the gratings moving in a forward direction, then the larva follow these gratings and adjust their speed to the speed of the grating so that they are keeping pace with the grating itself. Okay. And this is the behavior, this optomotor response is the behavior that we used to ask how animals control speed. So what we found in one of the early experiments was that dopamine can make fish swim faster. So on the left hand side is a larva swimming in response to the grating at a certain speed. And now look at the larva, same larva, when we put dopamine in the water in which it's swimming. It's swimming much, much faster, right? So this was a very, very curious observation that we made. And we wanted to understand how is it that dopamine is making the fish swim faster. So to do that, what we did was we embedded the fish in a jelly-like material, agarose, such that the head was fixed and the tail was free to move. And then we can place it under a microscope and look at the tail movements in much greater detail. And when we did that, what we found was that the tail was moving over a much larger extent when dopamine was present compared to control. In control, the tip was only moving over a small angle range, whereas in agonist, it was moving over a much broader range, right? That's uh, shown here in this graph. So then the question is, how is it that the dopamine is making the tail move over a much larger angle? Because if you move the, uh, flip the tail over a much larger range, then you get greater propulsion. Vatsala, I think we've lost you again. Hello, do give us a few seconds. Yeah, sorry. I think it's uh, when I play the video, it's not able to, um, the bandwidth is uh, restricted. Perhaps I've switched to my phone's network and that should be better, I think. Um, I will share screen one more time. Yeah. Yeah. So to understand what makes the tail bend more, we put the fish again um, underneath a screen where we were presenting the black and white gratings. And then we recorded the neural signals coming out of the spinal cord by placing an electrode on the muscle itself. And what we found was that the, um, in the presence of dopamine, the signals were much bigger compared to control conditions. See now, these when the grating is moving, the fish is making these fish swim bouts, which are these vertical bars that you see. Those are electrical impulses from the nervous system. And you can see that the size of the electrical impulses is much larger when dopamine is present compared to when it's absent. So what this told us was that the nervous system was behaving differently in the presence of dopamine to make the tail bend over a larger angle and thus allowing the fish to swim faster. So the question now is what is the mechanism behind it? How is, it, how is the nervous system responding differently? So to understand that, we then looked at single neurons. So the same sort of preparation with the fish larva placed on top of a screen showing them the gratings. But now instead of sampling an entire population of neurons, we put electrodes so that we can monitor activity of single neurons. And what we found was this, that again, when the grating was moving, the fish was making these signals with tall 
action potentials these things are action potentials but in normal water there are few action potentials whereas in dopamine there are many more action potentials the more action potentials you have the more command is being given to the muscle and when the muscle receives a lot of commands then it contracts even more and when it contracts more then the tail bends more and when the tail bends more then the fish swims faster right so that was the mechanism by which it was doing but then again the question is you know you can ask how is it that the motor neuron is firing more so every neuron is like an electrical device it receives inputs and then it makes outputs outputs are in the form of the action potentials that i told you about any communication from the neuron to the next neuron needs to be in the form of action potential so any signal that comes into the neuron is in the form of current inputs the neuron integrates these current inputs and then makes action potentials now what we found was that the same neurons when dopamine is present for the same amount of current make many more action potentials so they are integrating information differently when the uh, dopamine is present right so it's like a different transfer function is how engineers would like to call it um so the same current input but different voltage out output leads to a behavioral modification which is that speed is increased right so to summarize then what i've told you today is that you know you have signals coming from the spinal cord making movements of a certain kind so imagine this um uh, wave here in white to be the frequency of swim movements that you see in the tail the tail moving left and right left and right the size of that signal is increased by increasing the motor neuronal firing rate by making them fire more for the same sort of brain commands coming in and then because of this increased firing rate then the fish is able to move at a faster pace so that is uh, the bottom line so just wanted to tell you that you can start from a simple behavioral observation and work all the way down to the level of single neurons and or even single molecules similarly you can start with single molecules and build up all the way to behavior and ask what is the effect of this single molecule at the level of the behavior right so it's any scientific problem can go as far as your curiosity goes so um i wish you all all the best in your futures um and these this is my team at ncbs these are the funding agencies that have enabled this work um and i hope to hear from all of you during the q and a session thank you thank you dr vatsala it's always a pleasure to your uh, vatsala's uh, talk so right curiosity uh, drives science there is no applied science without uh, the basic science well said vatsala and i'm sure that you have added dopamine dopamine to the young minds so i hope they move faster towards their goal thank you thank you dr vatsala thank you raji So the next uh, speaker of uh, our session is Dr. Praveen Vemula. So Dr. Praveen Vemula is a faculty at Institute of Stem Cell Science and Regenerative Medicine. He is known for uh, translating his research and uh, technologies towards a commercial um, applications. He is a co-founder of uh, three biotech companies. The technology developed under his leadership was uh, to act inactivate pesticides has been recognized. Uh, with the prestigious Gandhian Young Technological in Innovation Awards uh, in the year 2019, Ramula's uh, uh, Ramula's team has been um, working on uh, several technologies. Uh, one of the important uh, recent technology that they have uh, uh, um, formulated is to uh, is the invention of uh, germicidal fabric called. gfab and it's been used to make mask uh, which can act against uh, uh, and sars coronavirus uh, which can inactivate sars coronavirus so 
with that note, I am um, excited to know more about your translational research, Dr. Praveen Ramuda. Over to you. Thank you, Raji. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think uh, uh, Watsala has like nicely set the stage to see like uh, how the curiosity can make you to study very fundamental phenomena and build up the process from there to apply that. So uh, now I would like to like give one more example to see like uh, how a curiosity can lead to identifying the or discovering new biological phenomena and also can lead to the developing new drugs for a variety of diseases. Especially we can discuss about like, you know, how the gut microbial metabolites such as, you know, erolithins can be used as a potential new drugs for the treatment of <clears throat> inflammatory bowel diseases. So uh, when you talk about IBDs, right, IBDs generally comes in like uh, two variants, uh, ulcerative colitis and the Crohn's diseases. And in ulcerative colitis is primarily or large intestines which get inflamed. But whereas in the Crohn's diseases, you have, uh, in addition to large intestine, your small intestines also get the just patches of inflammation. And uh, in, but like in both cases, these are like a chronic disorders. Once people get like, you know, they suffer for years together. And if you see the standard therapy today, or like uh, having, uh, using the steroidal or non-steroidal based anti-inflammatory agents or the immunosuppressants, uh, but like, uh, unfortunately, if you see like uh, these classes of uh, drugs, these are like a uh, disease managing drugs, rather like, you know, uh, that means like uh, they can take care of the symptoms, but not the cause. So because of that, like, you know, overall therapeutic outcome, if you see, is a very moderate in the current state of the treatment. So that's where we thought like, you know, can we develop a <clears throat> new class of drugs, which could be used for the treatment of IBDs, which can have much more beneficial effect for the treating these patients. So, uh, but the question is where to start, right? So in, if you see the classical chemical biology approach or the drug discovery approach, where, because majority of the targets are known for these diseases, right? Like then you can take, you know, millions of random library of molecule, screen them and identify leads and build the drugs from there. So there's a classical approach, what we normally see. Then we thought like, can we do a little differently? So what we thought is like, instead of uh, going to screen like large number of molecules, can we understand the you know, local environment where this disease occurs and taking the cues from there, can we build any new potential drugs? That was the approach what we take. And, uh, and you know, we all know that like, you know, our gut harbors like, you know, billions of bacteria. Uh, in our body. And like, you know, this is uh, famously called gut microbiome or intestinal flora. And, but like how uh, no organism stays without any job, right? So there, there should be a reason for them. And this microbiota, people have shown that this has much beneficial effect in uh, maintaining our body functions. And, but when you have the dysfunction or like a disbalance, imbalance of this bac uh, bacteria, that can lead to the very adverse effect also can manifest the various diseases. And recently people have shown that, in fact, uh, this microbiome plays major role and controls the function of majority of the pivotal uh, organs as well. And the question is how they do it, right? So typically whenever you take diet and this diet can be broken down into small molecules by this uh, bacteria, so these molecules called metabolites because this microbial, uh, they degrade and develop. And all these small molecular metabolites have various functions. Each one have the very crucial functions. So we thought like uh, if the microbes can modulate our functions by using these molecules as handles, can we understand a little more about these molecules and their role in biological functions? By taking that lead, can we develop the drugs? That was our overall approach. That's a simple question. Uh, 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 we started our journey. If you see like uh, typically any phytochemical rich diet, such as, you know, you take pomegranate or cherries and berries, you know, they have shown that like they do have very beneficial effect and by reducing your gut inflammation in general, right? But in specific, if you see like when you take this phytochemical rich diet in the gut, they start uh, in the stomach, they start degrading and start forming this polyphenols called elagitins. And the specific bacteria that present in our colon, it start degrade further and start making much more smaller uh, metabolites. These are polyphenols uh, class, uh, called erolithins. 
And people have been trying to study the role of these erolithins. And what we have also done is like uh, uh, systematically, we synthesized all these metabolites and individually we tested their uh, you know, uh, ability or the properties to see whether do they have the anti-inflammatory properties. By using like various cell-based assays, we have shown that, uh, identified that erolithin A is the most potent anti-inflammatory agent this uh, bugs can produce. So we thought, okay, now we have this compound. So can we go and test against the you know, um, animals that carries the disease? Can we able to cure them? And we went and we uh, gave this compound to the animals that have the colitis. But like surprisingly, none of them work. None of them showed any beneficial effect. But whereas when you have the in isolated various uh, cell-based in vitro condition, it works very well. But as soon as you put it in the animal, you don't see any effect. So uh, if you see the simple chemistry, right? This compound, if you see, it's a biphenol. It's a biphenol compound, but it's a locked by using a cyclic ester called lactone. So because of that, this entire structure in a locked planar form, which is essential for showing its efficacy. Uh, but when it goes to the stomach, you know, you have digestive enzymes and low pH conditions that can easily break your ester, right? And that uh, once it uh, esters broken down, idealized, and biphenols, you know, the most favorable structure is the uh, propellar structure instead of planar structure. So once you lose the planar structure, it loses its efficacy. So we thought like maybe that could be the primary reason why we don't see any effect in the body, right, in, in, in vivo. So to stabilize that, what we have done is we, um, we chose the power of nanotechnology. We used various small molecules and polymer-based excipients to build this nanoparticle, which is about like a 200 plus nanometers. These are like a small tennis balls, right? At the core of nanoparticle, you can encapsulate these uh, erolithins and this nanoparticle protect them and prevent the exposure to the extreme pH or digestive enzymes so that it can prevent the degradation. Then we went and tested whether now uh, this nanoparticle have the ability to you know, decrease the disease. So what we do is like you take the animals and expose to a chemical called dextran sodium sulfate. One, uh, for seven days, when you expose them, all these animals develop the colitis, okay? And now you give the treatment, either a simple molecule directly uh, through oral gavage you give them, or same doses of compound, you can put it in the nanoparticle and give them, right? And when you do that, then we see the very remarkably different results. For example, if you see uh, the length of colon, in a, this is in a healthy animal length, right? This, uh, and which is longer. But when you have the disease, and since you have the severe inflammation, you see the loss of colon, and you can see the shortening of the colon uh, when you have the disease. But when you give the treatment with only drug, like uh, the compound without protection, or just giving only nanoparticle without drug didn't have any beneficial effect. You see the still loss of the colon. But whereas same amount of drug, put it in the nanoparticle and give them, you can see the drastic effect. It's a completely prevented the loss of uh, uh, colon. And similarly, if you go and uh, uh, do the histology and see the intestine structure, you know, in a healthy condition, this is how you see, right? Your intestine has crypt and villi structures, which retain, but uh, during disease conditions, you completely lose the <laughs> such villi structures. But whereas when you put it in the nanoparticle and give this drug, you can see completely restoring the, as good as your healthy animal, which is clearly suggests the beneficial effect of this compound now. Then we wanted to see how far this can go, right? So then what we have done is we have developed this severe colitis. And after that, uh, once we developed the colitis, we gave one single dose administration and checked for the overall effect. Even when you do the single dose administration, when you see in the nanoparticle uh, erolithin, it's completely protected, right? Uh, you know, your villi structures are as good as um, your normal uh, healthy colon. So we are super excited about this, right? Like, you know, we're, but one hand we were excited, but like we didn't allow our excitement carried away for asking one of the question because it started bothering us more than exciting because our, what is the hypothesis? You have inflammation and these are severe inflammation uh, condition, right? And what we are doing is like uh, by having this anti-inflammatory properties, you're just clearing up the inflammation. 
But if you see the disease pathology in the normal conditions in the gut, what happens? You have this single layer of cells called epithelial cells, and these are packed together by the help of uh, proteins called tight junction proteins. These are like a stitches. Okay, these are uh, these protein stitches all the cells together to have a tight. Uh, line because of that all the bacteria uh, that sits in the gut it's not really exposed to the body that's how you you keep the healthy environment but in the disease conditions what happen when you have the inflammation all these proteins that keeps the cells together you lose them all these tight junctional proteins you lose them so because of that you start have uh, all the cells fall uh, fall off then you have the leaky barrier so because of this leaky barrier all the bacteria that sits in the gut they keep getting exposed to uh, your circulation that activates your immune system that's why you see the persistent inflammation in these patients now if you come back to the effect of this compound if this compound only anti inflammatory agent right it shouldn't have such a drastic phenotype uh, imagine now you have a pipe with a leak right if water is coming out if keep wiping your water uh, without closing the uh, uh, leak so you will be not able to solve the leakage problem at all right this is still remain the same logic we applied uh, we thought is this compound not just acting as anti inflammatory compound but somehow it's activating the um, stimulating the epithelial cells and making that like all these tight junctional proteins are over expressed so that all these proteins can stitch back your cells so that it can completely protect the leaky barrier once it closes off then you, there is no longer it can um, have the uh, bacteria exposure right then you will have much more beneficial effect this compound might be doing that so we thought let's go and test that hypothesis and also simultaneously what we have done is uh, as i told you this compound itself like uh, highly unstable if you don't put it in the nanoparticle right so we thought why don't we make a chemical modification so that like we can uh, have the much more stable compound for example if you see this ester bond was taken out and made the ether bond and as you know like uh, typical ethers are not uh, uh, you know degradable by using simple digestive enzymes or the ph so this is the classical chemistry by using lewis acid chemistry and the uh, sodium borohydrate reduction one can make them but when you expose these compounds to digestive enzymes your synthetic compound don't degrade at all but whereas your natural compound completely degrades that shows the uh, your actual new compound is completely stable then we went and tested whether really these compounds are able to produce these tight junctional proteins like a stitch proteins right so when you take this epithelial cells and uh, then you measure the how much amount of this protein these uh, cells have under normal condition say if this is the amount of protein it has but when you expose to this compounds you can see the amount of tight junctional proteins increases drastically and and this is true for all the tight junctional proteins such as cladin 4 rucrudine and so on which means like uh, this might be actually restoring the barrier to have the beneficial effect then we wanted to see whether is it true in uh, in animals as well in vivo conditions again we develop the disease in the animals and when you give the treatment so after the treatment what we do is like we want to see whether it has the leaky properties or not one way to do is you take this polymer which is connected to a fluorescent molecule and give them orally to the mice and collect the blood and see how much of this polymer that was given orally came into the blood okay now if you see if you quantify that in healthy animals you really don't see much Okay, do excuse us. Uh, I think we've lost Praveen. Just wait a couple of seconds for him to come back. We'll just wait for a second. There might have been a power cut or something, so uh, we'll just wait for. Uh, 
तब इनको हम बात कर रहे हैं Ravi, hello yeah uh, sorry i think there is a power fluctuation sorry i got that yes yes can so, i no worries just start a little bit uh, rub about maybe 2 3 minutes is it okay now yes yeah you can hear me now right okay oh, yes, great can hear me yeah Go so uh, then uh, yeah so as i mentioned then when we tested for the leakiness of this and as you can see in healthy animals when you measure the amount of polymer that comes into the blood circulation is very low because you have healthy intestine but when you have the disease and you can see huge amount of polymer comes into the circulation blood blood circulation which means your intestine actually have the breach because of the leaky barrier it is coming out but whereas when you treated with this compounds you see completely reduction of such leakiness which is clearly suggesting that indeed this these compounds are able to actually restore the uh, you know leaky barrier have the beneficial effect and also we showed that like you know uh, they also reduce the pro inflammatory cytokines which actually cause the inflammation um, and more importantly if we see the uh, structure of the intestine again they restore entire villi structures and so on and not only in the um, acute conditions we also tested very severe conditions like a chronic colitis conditions where multiple times uh, these animals were exposed to this uh, disease causing chemical dexam sodium sulfate periodically but even with that you can see uh, a severe phenotype where you know um, without treatment you see huge leak of the uh, polymer in the intestine but whereas uh, with a treatment you can completely prevent that and again we see the anti inflammatory effect and the colon is perfectly fine when you treat with this compounds you can see prevent the loss of colon structure and so on so you know overall we could able to see that like, in fact this compounds as traditionally people is to believe that these are anti inflammatory compounds by asking right questions we could able to uh, find out that it's a new biological role of these compounds by protecting trans uh, and this leaky barrier by over expression type junctional proteins and once we have that you know we need to take to the next level right for example you know when you want to do translational science that means like when the technology is what we develop which if really need to go to the people so that's entire uh, entire translational plot this is the classical depiction of value of that that exists in this path which means even after developing scientific breakthroughs in the lab these breakthroughs should be converted into a viable technologies or viable product to reach to the end uh, end users such as patients right so for that one can do very efficient entrepreneurship program then only you can convert your discoveries into actual technologies to reach to the people so we are also equally uh, excited and practice the entrepreneurship at instant and for that what we have done is once we developed the technologies we patented these technologies and we went and formed a startup company and all the uh, patents is licensed to the company now we extensively collaborate with the company to uh, explore the or um, uh, find out all the toxicity and safety profiles of these molecules and also we are doing extensive medicinal chemistry for the to identify even more potent molecules than what we have today so overall i i demonstrated that i think like you know asking like you know real curious questions one can lead to the you know you can uh, reunderstand or get the completely new understanding of the existing phenomena which can lead to the complete breakthroughs with that i would like to stop here and these are the students who really did the work they are students like you and were the phd's and post docs in our laboratory and i would like to thank all the, my collaborators as well and the funding sources and i'll stop here i think uh, we will discuss more about like you know when we have the q and a session thank you over to you rajiv yes. thank you thank you dr vimula for a, a wonderful talk 
and uh, it looks like uh, it, it, the molecule ha uh, seems to have an immediate application. We can see the translational output soon. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Narendra Chumule. He's a co-founder uh, and the CEO of a company called Symphony Tech Biologics, a data analytic company focused on engineering solutions to biology. He's a former head of R&D at Biocon Bangalore. He has an intensive industrial experience in leadership positions in several biotech companies. His notable contributions are in the field of vaccine development and the pharmaceutical. And he was uh, worked on developing a landmark vaccines for cervical cancer, childhood diarrhea, osteoporosis, and many more. And I'm glad to welcome Dr. Chumule. Uh, looking forward to your, your, your journey to in industrial research. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you, Raji. Thank you, Subal Lakshmi. And uh, thank you Arvind, for inviting me and, and setting up this panel. Um, Vatsala and uh, Praveen, I really enjoyed your talk. I, I've been taking voracious notes. I'm going to get back to you, both of you. There's so many interesting th things we can do together. I think that's, uh, I didn't realize that, you know, we all are doing similar things. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about curiosity. But uh, before we do curiosity, uh, let me do something completely different. I'll tell you why I did that, <laughs> uh, because uh, I'm going to talk about a particular topic um, in a, in my presentation, which which is again our, our theme is curiosity, and um, I was uh, <laughs> actually Vatsala, I didn't know the answer to that question. I thought it was the birthday. <laughs> 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 uh, Anyway, thank you for sharing that uh, interesting information for us. Um, so my quick background um, and the reason I'm presenting it, uh, Raji, you gave me a very nice uh, in, uh, introduction. Um, I did my high school in, uh, in Lucknow, um, and then I did my PhD in Tata Hospital in Bombay. Uh, and then for 30 years, I did uh, drug development in vaccine and biologics in the United States. Um, Naren, if you could excuse me, maybe you can speak a little bit louder or uh, be placed a bit closer to the mic. Yeah, yeah, you know, okay. Uh, thank you for giving me that feedback. Um, yeah, so um, the so my background uh, is in has been in deep science all the time, right? I've been talking about science and um, you know, we, but then I love to do. I love my hobbies, and it is only much later in my life did I realize that it is the hobbies that make the career, not the career. It is the hobbies that make the career because with my hobbies, I've been able to connect to so many different people that I would have never been able to connect if I, if I only did my work. Uh, that's why I played the flute. <laughs> in fact, I've played the flute in a meeting where the chief minister of Karnataka was there. In the, in, from the audience, I just played the flute. And everybody remembers that. Um, so let me tell you a story uh, of, of the theme I'm trying to get at, how to, how to become curious and how to get to innovation. So a friend of mine, his daughter, about 12 years old, Jan Navi in Bangalore, um, one day I went to their house and I asked her, what subjects do you like in school? Uh, she said, I like biology, but, you know, I don't like mathematics and chemistry or you know, these, these subjects are not, are not too thrilling. I said, okay, let's evaluate what, you, what that means. So what we did is we drew a small picture on her, on her notebook and we draw a line in the middle and at the top of the line, we saw, okay, let's draw um, animals and plants. And so we drew all the animals and plants and trees 
and in the ocean there are fish, et cetera, et cetera, right? That is all biology. Now, what is biology made up of? It is made up of DNA and DNA is what? Biochemistry. And what is DNA? If you go down further, uh, DNA is made up of these structures, right? Chemical, chemical structures, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. What is what are carbon made up of? Carbon is made up of physics. You have electrons, protons, neutrons, all circulating in a very or, you know, predictable manner. And when you look at the look at the protons and electrons and how they move in space, it's quantum physics. So biology is connected to quantum physics, not some random subject over there, right? Now, if you move over the surface of the earth, uh, air is 70, 75% nitrogen, um, five, 10% oxygen um, and carbon and hydrogen, right? As you move up off the surface of the earth from troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere and thermosphere, you don't have oxygen and hydrogen. They, they, uh, you have primarily nitrogen in the, in the air, your oxygen reduces. And then you have your solar system, um, which is looking like the atom, isn't it? The solar system looks like the atom. So there's some similarities there. Then you get the news one day that they found water on, they found water on Mars. And he said, hey, what's the big deal? Water on Mars? We have tons of water on Earth. Why, what's the big deal in finding water on Mars? It's a very big deal because for 10,000 miles, there is no oxygen or hydrogen. How can there be water on Mars? So, it's a rem so these kind of things make you realize what to look for. And all of that again is physics, chemistry, everything is sort of interrelated. So all these subjects are interrelated. And after Janavi and I talked about all of this, a beautiful art picture emerged, isn't it? So it's a combination of all of these interdisciplinary subjects that makes you really evolve in your own curiosity journey. And it is both the left and right brains that you have to develop. So let me talk about inventions and curiosity. So what is man's most radical invention ever? It is the wheel. We also have a statement in our English language saying, Hey, don't reinvent the wheel. It's so good, we have a sentence for it. Don't reinvent the wheel. However, you know, animal with a wheel is not that great an invention that evolution utilized um, the wheel as a means of, of movement, right? So we have to be careful what, what, what we think is innovation. So in my own, in my own uh, thought process, I've put innovation as two way, two ways to look at innovation. One is I call the top-down approach and the other I call as bottoms up approach. What happens in the top-down approach is this. We have to innovate because we have to solve a problem. And usually the problem is very difficult problem we have to solve. That's why you need innovation. Now, when we have to solve something like I'm, I'm giving the metaphor of a box here, um, to solve a big problem, we break that problem into, into small pieces. When we break it down, then we think it's manageable and we can solve all of these small, small problems. And then we'll reconstruct the box and we'll say, okay, the box, we think that the problem is solved. But what generally happens is one of the boxes was so difficult, but we didn't solve it. We said, okay, we've, we've solved three of the four boxes. Um, you know, I think it's solved, let's go on. And what happens is, over, over time, the entire innovation falls apart and the innovation doesn't work, doesn't stand the test of time. On the other hand, if you come from the bottoms up approach that are, and you solve small, small problems and you solve them completely, they stand the test of time. Now, what are examples of this? Pharmaceutical drugs is an example. There's a drug called Vioxx that was a miracle drug uh, in the 1990s, 80s. It was amazing for painkillers, for, for, for killing pain. But when lots of people started using it, people started getting heart attacks and dying. When, so clearly that was not such a great invention because it had this side effect, right? Meanwhile, from the bottoms up approach, evolution uses this bottoms up approach. When a tadpole needs to transform into a frog, 
it undergoes a lot of little, little, little mutations over a long period of time. It tries them out, tries them out, and ultimately it becomes a frog. And this innovation lasts forever, right? So in general, top-down approaches you, you, of innovation, you innovate when no solution exists and I need to create something new. That is when you use the top-down approach. And the bottom -ups, bottoms up approach is there's already something, I want to improve it further, that innovation is the bottom up approach. And why am I telling you all of this is, it's not black and white. So in your innovation, in your continuum, you need to know where you are, you need to know your surroundings. And then in this respect, there are amazing innovations that have happened over the, over the centuries in both art and science. How did I become curious? So. I never knew anything about this disease that I'm going to talk about, right? Motor neuron disease, or also called ALS. And uh, there was no reason for me to learn about this disease. That I was like, I'm not interested in this disease. Okay, Stephen Hawkins has that disease and I've read some of his books, great. I, but you know, it didn't, didn't interest me until a friend of mine got this disease. A very close friend of mine got this disease. And then suddenly this disease became very interesting to me. I wanted to find out everything about this disease. And when I researched this disease, it, I, it, I found out that there is a gene uh, that is mutated. It's called the C9 of 72 gene, which is involved in the pathogenesis of the disease. When this gene is mutated, the neurons die and therefore you get this disease. Now an interesting phenomenon, as I am reading these papers on C9 of gene, is that there's a relationship between the C9 off gene and, gut, and gut, by, um, gut bacteria. So this is a small experiment that was done in that paper. Take a normal mouse and you put healthy bacteria, good bacteria into the gut of the normal mouse, you don't get motor neuron disease. You put pathogenic bacteria, bad bacteria, and you put it in the normal mouse and it doesn't get motor neuron disease. But if you take a mouse, which has the gene that is deleted for C9 or 72, and you put pathogenic bacteria, this mouse gets ALS disease. So this relationship between gut, by, gut bacteria and the gene defect is a very interesting defect. And that's why Praveen, I was telling you, <laughs> there's a connection between what we are trying to do. Did you know there are two known, new, there are more two new nucleotides in addition to ACTG, there are two more nucleotides. We learned this from high school, but if you're not curious enough and you don't know what's going on around you, you won't know that two, new, two more nucleotides have been artificially synthesized. Not only that, a bacteria has been made with six nucleotides, right? In Bangalore, in an Institute of Science, there are professors and who are working on this, where you can actually store DNA, you can store electronic data on DNA. DNA is the place where we store our natural information, right? So why not electronic data? So now this is actually a reality. We're storing data on DNA, which will last millions of years. Stability will not be a problem. And I can go on. Virtual reality, the black hole, bionic eyes, quantum computer, 5G, all of these innovations are going to transform our lives forever. What are you going to do as students of science and, and, and arts? What are you going to do with all of this information? And how are you going to transform all of this? It's through curiosity, become curious. It will increase your learning during education. You can explore more. You can think more deeply, you can make rational decisions, have creative solutions, you'll make fewer errors and you will you'll have a good trusting relationships. So my last slide here actually says, study, study a lot, study the science, but look around you, do music, do art, do everything, do learn how to speak and, and do a lot of different things. All of it combined will make you a complete individual. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Chimuli. Uh, yes, we need science with, along with how this makes a life complete. And uh, can, you, uh, can you hear us? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we can. Yeah. I don't think we can hear you, Raji. Right. Sorry. Just speak into that. Speak into that. Can you hear me now? Better. So, 
thank you dr chimule um right you said to we have uh, you know we need hobbies along with science and uh, uh, make the life complete uh, uh, thank you for uh, that wonderful motivation and curiosity that you have fed us uh, thank you um, all the speakers for today i don't think there is any any better way to celebrate science day uh, than this so thank you all for uh, for your wonderful uh, talks and taking time for motivating our young minds um let's move on to the q and a sessions there that's going to be an interactive session with the uh, audience asking questions and i hope um i hand it over to subhashini she will be moderating this most of the sessions and uh, uh, yeah over to subhashini thank you raji thank you everyone uh, it was uh, such a wonderful meet and uh, the talks were all very curious and it was triggering our uh, um, curiosity and the way we understand uh, science and uh, internal life and um, there were uh, some of uh, some good questions that people have asked uh, so the first question was around uh, uh, in youtube uh, there was a person who asked about the origin of uh, Did you know the person's name so i don't do not have her link right now please uh, yeah. we request people to ask questions with yeah. affiliation so, so there was another person uh, named aishwarya anil uh, she had asked about the discovery discovery of uh, raman effect so i think uh, this question goes to uh, dr vatsala what is it the question is about the raman effect she, she wants to understand the discovery of uh, raman effect what, uh, what what is the question i didn't get the question uh, discovery of raman effect yeah but what about it oh no that's the that's the question <laughs> that's the question Let's okay so as i said the, in my yeah. in my talk the, just to briefly briefly answer that question uh, before raman made his discovery there, there was understanding of how light was scattered by air and this was uh, called as elastic scattering because you know the wavelength of the scattered light was not modified but in the case of raman effect the light that scattered by water is actually modified in wavelength but this effect is much much weaker so that the, all of the incident photons do not change their wavelengths but a small proportion of the incident photons do change their wavelengths i i hope that answers your question and that results in since it's mostly in the blue wavelengths that water scatters light the sea water appears blue does that does that answer your question i hope i guess uh, thank you vatsala uh, so the next question also is related to your study so a uh, person named vivek chetri Uh, he asked about uh, how to how do you measure the current uh, um, that is shown in your study yeah good question so we have um, a small glass capillary tube that we have special uh, heating filaments to pull them into very very tiny tipped electrodes and then we fill them with the uh, salt solution and then using uh, you know uh, specialized equipment to place this electrode right close to the neuron and then we make very tight seals and we can listen to current flowing in and out of the neuron this is typically in the pico amp range so ampere if you if you know in normal uh, electricity at homes we are talking about 5 amps for example but what we are talking about in the neuron is in the pico amp range meaning 10 to the minus 12 ampere so it's very very small but we have amplifiers again electronic equipment which can amplify the signal and show it at a size that we can appreciate on the computer and then we can look at these currents thank you vatsala um, the next question is uh, for chimule uh, why would you store uh, data in, in information in dna how will you retrieve and use it later and uh, so i'll add one more uh, point the bacteria you store the dna uh, you store the data in dna and what happens if it gets mutated don't you lose your data wonderful questions wonderful questions go read the papers about it i have no idea how this works i'm just giving you information <laughs> go read papers go research it <laughs> okay 
That's the answer for your question. Hope uh, that motivates you to read more papers on uh, data storage in genome. So, uh, thank you. The next question uh, is uh, to Dr. Praveen. Uh, it's uh, from uh, Arun Satyan. Uh, he had asked that the current diagnostic tool primarily used to study colitis and IBD in humans is, uh, is colonoscopy, which is invasive and uh, distressing. So that's his comment. So what's your opinion? Yeah, actually, that's a very fair point. In fact, uh, not only just colitis, and Crohn's or colitis, but any inflammatory disorders. Uh, right now, one of the major limitation is have lack of non-invasive diagnostic tools, right? Uh, at least in, in the colitis and all, uh, people are now trying to identify biomarkers, like, you know, for example, biomarkers in stool or urine, and or the protein content uh, in the stool to see whether we can have the correlation to identify whether your gut inflammation with these markers. Uh, but uh, still the majority, uh, major um, diagnosis still goes by the colonoscopy. So I think that's one of the um, breakthrough if one can have very reliable biomarker that can be used as a non-invasive diagnostic. And this is the same problem for like all the inflammatory disorders. It goes even difficult for the arthritis and all because their only pain is considered, uh, uh, you know, based on the pain bearing level, people see like they go and see the doctor because someone has the more pain bearing level doesn't mean that they have, um, you know, less inflammation and so on. So that's why like uh, people need to come up with, that's a huge area to identify the reliable biomarker to have the diagnosis. That answers his question. Um, the next question is Prajvit Rai. And he asks, uh, we always hear IT and BT field, and there are always startups in IT. Why not in BT? I mean, biotechnology, he means. Uh, what can we be the reason for this? Is that the lack of skill or the lack of funding? Uh, oh. Any of you, I mean, Praveen, any of you can answer this. Maybe Narim can uh, answer, then I can check. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, you know, I think um, the, the area, the, the short, I'm, I'll give you a short answer, then Praveen, you can uh, add. Narim, could you be, please speak louder? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something, yeah. Can you hear me now? I don't know. I'm, some, something's wrong with my sound. I even went out and came back. But let me quickly answer, then maybe Praveen can give the answer on more detail. I think the investment required for biotechnology is much higher. And that is one of the deterrent. And then, uh, so that is one of the major reasons, I think. And maybe, Praveen, you can elaborate on that. Uh, yeah, I think th that's a very valid point. And uh, one is like, you know, barrier to entry and also the timeline and the kind of investment need in biotechnologies, biotech-based startups are very high. Uh, even, f is it a typical, say, we can take like, you know, yeah, drug discovery programs like either the small molecule based or the biologics based uh, biotech companies if you want to form. Uh, yeah, the technology barrier is very high and uh, the timeline uh, uh, in order to like, you know, any startup to survive for years and like, you know, the kind of investment it need much larger compared to you know, uh, IT startups. Um, and then in, in terms of the regulations, you know, regulatory bodies have the huge barriers for, um, in a biotech tech, by, by sector, uh, this one. But other words, these are not the limitations and not the negative points, because these are the necessary uh, essentials to keep check in the biotech industry. So in a short answer, because these two are completely different sector and need different milestones, different skill set. Uh, and, uh, you know, different barrier to entry. But that doesn't mean that in biotechnology, we don't have the skill set. Absolutely, we do. Uh, but like, you know, the barrier to entry is far higher than IT sector. Thank you, Praveen. Uh, the next question is also uh, addressed towards you. So the, first, uh, the same person, uh, Arun, uh, had asked uh, if there is any way to modify the dye-based approach uh, in the uh, healing of intestinal epithelium uh, that can be used, uh, that is used for monitoring the human epithelial studies. So he has asked if there is any other uh, approach apart from that. Uh, could you please speak a little bit louder for the mic? Yeah, sure. Uh, am I audible now? 
yeah much yeah. better okay thank you so if there is any uh, other method apart from the dye based method uh, to monitor the healing of the intestinal epithelium yeah yeah so uh, uh, if you're talking about human again it comes back to uh, your colon only people do the colonoscopy okay and also another uh, it's a indirect method what people say is like you know um, uh, monitoring like you know blood in stools because when you have this severe colitis and all like you see completely a um, um, lot of blood loss through fecal content so that is one of the indirect method to see re reduction in the blood stool content um uh, again like uh, your uh, polymer but uh, flores and dye based polymer method is not been used in human okay because uh, that is just a surrogate method in to study in the uh, animals in human is still goes with the conventional colonoscopy and so on so uh, that's where again like you know it becomes very important of having a reliable reliable biomarker uh, because Uh, even when it comes to the clinical trials right i can't emphasize enough to show the importance of having a reliable readout a reliable biomarker to see the or you know quantify the therapeutic outcome in the, this clinical trials more often trials fail because lack of you know very reliable biomarker to see the efficiency that comes out of clinical output so Uh, again like you know there's a huge research going on uh, hopefully something come out like you know where uh, identifying this uh, direct biomarkers for this diagnosis or follow up yeah thank you and uh, there is a question from um, rachna she asked if uh, speed control uh, can be studied using any other organism other than zebra fish and uh, the question on the uh, uh, directed to uh, Patsala is again um, is the neuronal diseases are in in inheritable inheritable diseases. Yeah, so yeah, speed control can be studied in a lot of different organisms. In fact, a number of studies have been made using uh, another kind of fish called lamprey, which are uh, these eel-like fish. Uh, experiments have been done in tadpoles that you saw in Narin's uh, talk. experiments have been done in mice uh, each model organism you know brings with it its own advantages and disadvantages the main advantage with zebra fish is that like i showed you it's possible in the same organism to go from behavior to single neurons and monitor neuronal activity when the fish is behaving it's not so easily done for example in mice because to get to the spinal neurons in mice you'll have to do surgery unlike zebra fish larvae which don't have a skeletal system at this stage um, so there's only a skin so we can poke through the skin and get into the neurons but can't do that in mice so there are different advantages and disadvantages of different mod model organisms but of course biologists you know looking at locomotion use a number of different organisms ranging from invertebrates like c elegans drosophila and then of course like i said tadpoles leeches even um lots of different model organisms yeah and the second question about the motor neuron disease yeah there are some variants which are inherited uh, like the superoxide dismutase that narain was talking about there are families which have mutations in superoxide dismutase and in those cases the motor neuron disease is heritable okay and the next question is can we use any light system to uh, check if pathogenic microbes are present in any surface uh, anyone can take the question it's not clear what that means can you use any light you know to mm -hmm. see you know if, if you okay. like uv or so uh, uh, patsala sorry we can't hear you patsala I, i didn't say anything i was just trying to understand uh, what the question was uh, the microbes being generally small in size you know it's I, i i'm not sure if they can be seen like that anybody else on the panel might correct me but um, i don't think there exists a current method by which you can just shine a light on them and see them that, that, and that. also identifying pathogenic microbes based on light i think it would be very challenging right now i don't think any mm -hmm. method exists microbes 
and uh, i have a few questions i think it will address uh, it will be useful for many of the audience over here the question now is uh, how can one deal with the fear of failure when you think of initiating a journey as an ent entrepreneur uh, maybe uh, uh, yeah, yeah. That's... i can i can take it so so uh, uh, i'm going to give a slightly long answer but i think you you'll see why it is long right so uh, why of what is fear fear is something that is binary meaning you can either be fearful or you cannot be fearful there's no such thing i'm slightly fearful there's no such thing like that you can be slightly afraid you can be slightly scared but fear you can only be either fearful or no fearful and this fear is regulated by our amygdala in the brain right and evolutionarily we have an amygdala not because we can't get into a particular college or Mm, or we failed a particular exam that's not what that's what what that's not what uh, amygdala was evolved for it was evolved for running away from a tiger when you are in a jungle and a tiger attacks you you have only two choices either fight or run right but now we don't live in the jungle anymore there are no tigers right but when you fail an exam when you think you're going to fail an exam your brain thinks it's a tiger so when you fail an exam you think oh my god i'm going to die because your brain can't think any other way so fear is something that you have to train your mind not to be fearful about things that you should not be fearful about so what if you fail in an exam what happens nothing will happen you'll be fine you'll, you'll be absolutely fine in fact that failure will give you a path to choose which you will succeed in in the future so don't 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 fear fear <laughs> so i don't know if you want to add anything uh, praveen or vatsala uh, i think uh, they, they are talking even specific about entrepreneurship failing in entrepreneur entrepreneur. yeah why don't you, why don't you talk about fear of <laughs> fear of failing in, in entrepreneurship in, in fact uh, um, entrepreneurship i'll tell you 99% you fail <laughs> if not more okay so one of the best quality you should have if you want to be entrepreneur is like forget about the fear because very seldom you see success than failure in this one but that is the overall uh, output what we see right but like if you look at your daily operations in entrepreneurship okay every day that's a success because you will find a way a thing work a thing doesn't work okay and in fact that is the challenge that gives you like a how you circumvent that and solve it okay unless you small this little little uh, solve this little little step every day you can't make it uh, as an entrepreneur so uh, in fact like if any entrepreneur their first venture or second venture gets success i think they are doomed to be failure in later stage in fact like and in entrepreneurship especially unless you fail 10 times you don't really learn the nuances of the entrepreneurship so you go with that mindset then you will learn much better there's nothing to lose there in fact thank you thank you chimudi and uh, praveen and next question will be what are all the struggles the scientists face in translating their research to commercial product um, i think praveen should answer he showed a big Yeah, I think you know with the experience Narayan has, I think he can give ten examples. Why didn't you add it? <laughs> uh, you are on mute, uh, Narayan. Uh, Prabhu, why don't you start and I'll I'll uh, I'll add. Okay. So uh, Raji, can you repeat the question? It's like what is the limitations? Is it? Yeah. What are the yeah? What are the limitations and what are the struggles you have to face if you have to translate your uh, basic science into a research? I mean, into a commercial product. well you know uh, the struggle is same as like what if you are academician you know the struggle is same as what you what you want to get your work done and get published as well right it's a different level different hurdles what you see but i think the biggest challenge uh, translating your technologies from lab to market is like you know having that honest due diligence having rigorous due diligence to see the technology what you develop 
does it really have the potential to go to the next level okay because you see conceptually we can have the breakthroughs we can identify new signs exciting signs great but if you want to actually translate you know uh, the kind of rigorousness you need to put it there in terms of like you know uh, you when you might have the uh, new innovation but if there is a lot of priorities there how strong you know intellectual property is there okay if there is no strong intellectual property it's a very uh, seldom that in fact it becomes impossible to take to the next level and translating them okay because without even having new ip one can we can publish okay we can add the knowledge but having that rigorous level of ip generation is one of the critical point and these are the times like you know as an innovator we need to be like a super honest and super rigorous super critic by ourselves to see how much differentiating factor we got uh, we developed into this innovation compared to all the prior art that exist uh, before okay unless you have that and unless it is really solving a, uh, you know big unmet need it would be difficult right because having incremental changes some cases it might work but like if you want to really make it like an adventure and like have a uh, um, take to the end stage having incremental really doesn't take you there that's where like a you need to have the very strong ip and b uh, it comes to the process right how like you know get uh, once you even develop the technology there are multiple steps are involved like you know if you want to take to the next level like you know for example the first decision you have to make is whether your technology will be licensed to an existing company and let the company take the ownership and further develop to the bring to the market or like does your technology needs to go for a new startup and uh, then from there it has to be developed i think that's a very critical decision for any technology when you think about the technology transfer um, and that's where it, it comes to the what is the background knowledge you have about entire technology and opportunities and if you decided to go with uh, you know licensing that would be easy like you know a tech transfer officer can you know facilitate and you know help you in that but if you think about starting a company and like you know transferring technology there and taking the forward then you need to have some of the basic knowledge into various other fields other than just having our science right for example how you find a team because as an academician or entrepreneur full time you, you won't be going and doing that and in fact our training itself is a completely different right then you need to find a team of people who have the complementary skills and bring them into and we need to have the basic understanding about what all the regulatories we need to basic understanding about like you know how you pitch and raise the money because if you want to form the company you need to have the investors you have to raise the money and uh, then even some of the legal stuff like you know how to do your entire paperwork and you know what all the do's and don'ts there so like this each department one need to have at least basic knowledge i think uh, if you are planning to be like an science entrepreneur i think get yourself educated on these aspects and there are various platforms available i think one need to get you know places like c camp and all are fantastic they have, they conduct like various programs and workshops webinars um, one can easily get trained from, from those uh, this ones and like you know uh, if you're thinking in that aspect i think the best is find the people who are been there done that and bring them into your team and in and who also share same passion as you to converting technologies and work with them and after that actual fun starts in <laughs> fact thank you thank you praveen for the elaborate answer it has covered many of the questions asked in the chat box and uh, the another the next question is um, how a graduate student choose a lab for pursuing a phd what are the criteria one should consider before choosing a lab for for the phd uh, maybe what's up maybe you can take it yeah sure um very good question in fact there is a very nice article in uh, the journal neuron written by a late uh, professor ben baris on how to choose a graduate advisor there are basically two or three important things um number one that the person choose the pi not the project right because projects can change 
uh, but your equation with the pi or the principal investigator the your guide is much more important because that's going to decide what kind of training you're going to get um, and what kind of uh, relationship you're going to have with your mentor it's very important to have a healthy open communicative relationship with your research supervisor so choose the person not the project in the overall area right i mean in within biology you may say you know i like ecology or i like neuroscience um or i like cell biology you can choose areas like that but within those areas you know you should choose the person based on a um how good of a scientist they are based on the work that they've done before um and the rigor with which they do it their integrity things like that uh number 2 how good of a human being they are how open are they how much respect they give to their students it's important to treat students as colleagues because these are your future colleagues when they finish and come back um having their own positions um and so it's important for someone who shows that respect as someone who's um going to be who's nurtured to become a future scientist right um so so good science good heart i would say those two are very important things i don't know narain and uh, pravin you can also chip in i just looked at the paper and it's easily available you just type neuron and uh, how to choose a graduate professor you can find the paper on google can you it's just really... copy that link and put it on the chat box uh, narain so that yes i'll do that I'll, i'll do that i'll do that yeah yeah pravin you want to add something no i think uh, well said i think i been covered uh, but often what happens like you don't know the uh, person until you work with them so uh, of course we can get feedback from other colleagues and other students but like i can like you know there is always some perception right like if that particular mentor with that particular student might be very different interaction they have with another one so mm. you, you can find some general uh, trends but it becomes a bit difficult to find exactly because a person interact with other person is a reflection of their behavior as well right mm-hmm. so uh, there is always bias will come mm-hmm. so but if you can find right person in terms of right information that's great but like you know one of the important thing is is like you know end of the day again you have to do the science so uh, that is open out there that everybody knows what their lab does what a mentor does so at least science should excite you uh, you know that's right. one of yeah, the things science because, part is easier to evaluate than the heart part uh, and you know unless that excites you there is no point like mm-hmm. you can have a very nice person but like there is no science then it doesn't work so exactly because, uh, because say if two humans there is always conflict no matter how good two people are there is always conflict right so uh, i think at least prefer science and then after that you communicate and you resolve any issue can be resolved with the right. communication so i wouldn't see any there is one last question from kartik uh, bangalore university is it possible to make an hybrid organism which looks like a parent and strain morphologically that's a nice question that's the last question i think that is to narain right because he was talking about so <laughs> it's like narasimha we have been made for so many years so <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah one more you want narain you want to answer this question yeah yeah you know you know one of the one of the most uh, uh, most recent discoveries in making these chim- chimeric molecules is the car t cell chimeric antigen receptor t cell therapy which is transforming immuno oncology so it it utilizes the extracellular domain of um, it the binding domains of the antibody molecules the ve- heavy and variable domains and it is linked to the cytoplasmic tail of a t cell receptor which signals into the t cells this gene is put into a lentiviral vector which is transfected into t cells of autologous patients patients t cells are taken transfected put them back and these cells are now curing various kinds of leukemias so this is the chimeric this is the use of chimeric molecules uh, in innovation recently okay very good that's uh, 
very good place to end our session today. Uh, I want to thank all our fantastic panelists and especially all of those who asked questions as well, because I thought it was uh, Indeed. informative, not for people yeah. in all stages of careers, not just uh, in college. So thank you so much for uh, such an interactive session. Uh, so before I end it, I just certainly want to thank Raji and uh, Subhashini here for moderating the talk. Thank you so much. And uh, thank our IT team here. Uh, those who you cannot see, Chandrakant and Amrita, who's behind tweeting and doing our social. So uh, thank you very much for joining us and hope to see you in forthcoming sessions in the future. Thank you all. Thank you. Really enjoyed. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.